Hello and welcome to our continuing coverage here from Davos 2022. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with Rockefeller Foundation's Rajiv Shah. Rajiv, thanks very much for speaking to us and it's good to see you in person. We've been talking over Zoom through the pandemic. Uh, you know, the weather's bleak this afternoon and the mood is somewhat bleak here uh, at Davos as well on account of what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, let's talk about food because you call it a food emergency and the conversations that I've had so far in the near term there doesn't seem to look like we're going to see any solutions to this problem. Well Shreen it's great to be with you in person as you point out and I think the mood is bleak in part because there's an awareness of the confluence of challenges that are creating uh, an energy crisis, a food crisis, uh, for many uh, lesser lower income countries a debt crisis and when those things overlap it creates quite a lot of suffering and you're right right now the Russian invasion of Ukraine has taken 30 percent of the world's wheat off the global market it has reduced supplies of fertilizer nitrogen for fertilizer from Russia about 22 percent of the world's nitrogen supply came from there and so we are predicting that there will be significant food insecurity through this year and in fact, I think 2022 and part of 2023 could very well be the greatest food emergency since World War II on a global scale. And that really is an extraordinary statement to be making in this modern era. Absolutely. It is an extraordinary statement. But Rajiv, you know, as you said, this is going to be a problem that will exacerbate and could continue well into 2023. But what are the solutions that now need to be put in place? The over-dependence, for instance, uh, on Ukraine for wheat or uh, Russia for nitrogen. Uh, do you now see a move towards more diversification? Is that going to have to be done more urgently in terms of intervention? What's it that you expect? Yeah, well, I think the solutions are short term and long term. In the short term, uh, we know where the hotspots are around the world, where there will be significant hunger and starvation, uh, really, as we look at this summer and the fall. And we should be pre-positioning food stocks. We should be fully funding humanitarian aid agencies. And we should mount a big, urgent response. In the medium to long term, which I define as just the next few years, not <laughs> decades out, just the next few years, we need to significantly reinvest in domestic agricultural production and resilient supply chains for so many economies. Part of that requires countries doing the right thing when it comes to not banning the export of food. We know that Indonesia's ban on palm oil export, exports are exacerbating this crisis. Unfortunately, I think India's ban of wheat exports are going to make this situation worse uh, through the course of this year. And we need fewer countries to make those export bans uh, real. We also need real investment in regenerative agriculture, in agriculture that's less dependent on international inputs and on, on a sector that is so vital for almost every economy on the planet, but has been underinvested in mm. over the last decade systematically. You know, since you're talking about the underinvestment in agriculture, uh, is there a number in terms of what we will need, what the world will need to be able to achieve uh, some of the things that you spoke of? And specifically, as far as the export bans are concerned, since you talk about food insecurity and running right into 2023, uh, would you uh, allow for, uh, you know, or do you, do you understand or appreciate the fact that a government like India is taking this position in order to, to uh, ensure national security? Yeah. Well, let me speak to the second point first. I think uh, I understand why it is an instinctive, protective reaction to ban the export of critically needed food commodities. And for the purpose of domestic security and well-being in the very short term, weeks to months, it might help. But in reality, when many countries do that, what you end up with is a far less resilient and open global food economy. And if this crisis continues for 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, which we have reason to believe it will, it will end up hurting everybody after this initial three to four month period. So. Yes, I understand why such export bans are put into place, but we have seen, we saw this in 2007, yeah. 2008 during that crisis. Those bans hurt everyone if they last more than a few weeks and a few months. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're seeing many countries uh, move in this direction right now, and it's, it's not going to be very helpful. Mm. With respect to 2023, 
Look, I, th I think there are things we can do right now. The, the real level of agricultural investment probably ought to be around 15% of national budgets. Very few countries no. achieve that. Uh, but the truth is, you know, India is suffering through an extraordinarily historic heat wave. Agriculture is both the second greatest uh, contributor to carbon emissions. It's also the single greatest area where you can sequester carbon in regenerative agricultural models and take carbon out of the atmosphere and protect our planet. So there are a lot of reasons why greater agricultural investment can be both lucrative and can help sustain a more sustainable planet. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we spent the past year and a half talking about vaccine inequity. Now we're talking about food insecurity. And suddenly it looks like the world has moved on from that issue. And I know that, uh, you know, Bill Gates and many others here are trying to get people uh, to talk about the need for a pandemic treaty, to put together a plan to be prepared for the next pandemic. But specifically on the vaccine front, we've gone from a situation of not having enough for the world to now having a situation where vaccine makers like Serum are saying, we're sitting on supply and there are no takers. What do you make of that? Well, th there's clearly been a failure in the global push around vaccines in developing and emerging economies. I think all in across developing countries, less than 20% of people have received their first dose of the vaccine. That's simply not adequate to, to protect a population. So the reality is the Rockefeller Foundation is investing in vaccine access in country after country and our target is to reach 90% of the high-risk groups within a country. And uh, we think that's an appropriate kind of first-stage target. I do think there needs to be some sort of international agreement about how the world responds to mm. pandemics. Part of that has to include a much better real-time surveillance system. It has to include global capacity that is distributed. It's great that India is the world's mm. largest vaccine producer by volume. Africa, Latin America also needs real production capability. So we have the ability to scale up the manufacturing of such products. And frankly, it requires uh, communications mm. and education. I mean, a big part of why the vaccines are not being demanded right now is there's tremendous misinformation about uh, the vaccines, their effectiveness, their safety. And so a lot of people who need them don't want them because they've been told something that's false. And we need to invest in that problem in order to turn it around mm -hmm. and change the course of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah, vaccine inequity, of course, is a big focus area for you at the Rockefeller Foundation, but you're also working with the WHO as now a non-state actor uh, on the larger issue of health equity. Uh, what kind of investments are we talking about? Where will you be making them? And what's going to be the priority? Well, our first priority is to build for the planet a common data architecture to share data on epidemics and pandemics. It is shocking to me as someone who's worked on the Ebola crisis in 2014, the Zika crisis a few years after that. That we now, don't learn. COVID, that we never learn. <laughs> and every time we go back and review what we should have done, the first thing is have a real-time, open, completely transparent system for seeing where cases are in a geo-specific manner. And the fact that we can do that in so many other walks of life, but we cannot do that in pandemic data surveillance is a huge problem. So the Rockefeller Foundation has created the Pandemic Prevention Institute with the WHO and a host of other partners in order to provide for the world a platform for that kind of coming together, sharing data and sharing solutions based on seeing that data. That's just one example mm. of how we're using the, as you mentioned, the role of being a non-state actor, partner of the World Health Organization to help improve people's lives. You know, it's interesting you said that we never seem to learn from the from the past. And here everyone's assuming that at least uh, given the, the kind of devastating impact that COVID has had, that this time around it's going to be different. Do you believe so? It will only be different if we make it different. Yeah. And, you know, it is true. I think Serum Institute is sitting on 100 million plus extra 200 doses, million 200 plus. million doses. You, you'll have U.S. companies will, will describe a million doses of X, Y, or Z that they're also sitting on. So we have a problem right now. We need to learn from that problem to better match supply and demand and to finally appreciate that if you don't invest in communication, in connection, in, ex in helping people understand why they need the vaccine, you can't just produce doses and expect they're going to come and acquire them and take them. We've never seen that work in history. 
and it is time we learn learn from those lessons and do things differently. Yes, uh, that certainly is the hope. But uh, you know, from a India point of view, uh, what's the priority that Rockefeller Foundation is going to focus on? Well, our, our, our focus in India has been around energy, food, and health. In health, it's been accelerating the pandemic response using data and digital tools. In food, it has been expanding on regenerative agriculture and food security investments to protect those who are vulnerable. And our single biggest effort has been to bring 300 million people in mostly rural communities in India that don't have adequate, consistent access to always-on electricity mm -hmm. to bring them power through solar mini grids and other forms of distributed renewable technologies. And we have great partners like Tata Power, uh, but so many others as well that are smaller, that are active in Bihar and UP and Uttaranjal and in building out these, these systems. And what we see, there are 900,000 Indian families that are customers of these mini solar systems. They are paying for the power and they're using their access to electricity to move their families up the economic ladder, give girls a chance to study at night and go mm. to school, give uh, parents a chance to generate more income from their activity, whether it's a power sewing mm. machine or a power rice huller. And that is what we're all about at the Rockefeller Foundation, is helping people improve their lives by making sure they have the tools and technologies to upgrade their living standards. And I just want to dig a little deeper into this because we're currently also facing uh, a power crisis in yeah. India with uh, power outages across different states because there isn't enough coal. Uh, this solution that you just spoke to us about, how do you intend to scale it further? And what have been the learnings from this? Because, you know, power has been a vexed issue in India for decades now. You're saying that people are willing to pay uh, because they're getting a service. We have a situation where we have distribution companies with mountains of losses yeah. and no ways for state governments now to, you know, to find their way out of this situation. Yeah. So what are the learnings from this experiment? Well, I think three big learnings. The first is if you provide reliable, always-on power, which many of the discos don't provide as consistently to rural customers, they will pay and pay consistently for that power. And I have walked through villages and met families in Bihar that are benefiting as customers of these solar mini-grids. And they tell story after story of how access to power has changed their lives for the better. So they will pay. A second lesson is we know this is the path upward in terms of the economy. I met a carpenter who explained the difference between running a small shop without power or with re unreliable government power versus reliable power that came from a Rockefeller partner. And the difference was he bought power tools, he created jobs, mm. you see upward income growth in his family and the family of his employees. That's what we need to see more of. The third big lesson is that renewable energy can be used for industrial loads. And I know for a long time people thought only coal tied to large-scale transmission can support industrial loads. But with today's renewable technologies, including stationary storage and battery storage, much of what we think of as productive power use can come from renewable sources. So India has an opportunity, 81 countries around the world that house 3.6 billion people that live under 1,000 kilowatt hours of power consumption per year per capita have an opportunity to do things differently going forward by prioritizing renewable technology. Well, it boils down to prioritization and execution, and this time we hope... And leadership. Uh, and, lead <laughs> and leadership. Yeah. Yes, that, that of course is, is significantly uh, important. But Rajiv, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for speaking to us on CNBC TV 18. The conversations will continue here in Davos. We're back in a moment after this very short break with a lot more.